So I'm, uh, I'm really happy to see all of you here today and uh, especially happy to see our seminar speaker who's joining us from New Zealand today. Uh, Mary Sewell is a person who's, who's well known to, to many of us who work on invertebrate larvae. She's been doing reproductive and larval work and various other kinds of biology for a long time. She's an authority on echinoderms. And I remember uh, when I first met her that she was the most fanatical, obsessed person about holothurians that I had ever met. She loved holothurians and I thought she was going to spend her entire uh, career working on every holothurian in the world. Um, but she's branched out a little bit into, uh, into uh, that, the other entire phylum of, of the echinodermata. So she's very much an authority on the echinoderms. Uh, Mary did her master's degree working on a holothurian in Auckland, uh, where she now is a, a professor who's replaced the professor that she did her master's degree under a long time ago. She then went to Canada, uh, did her PhD in the lab of uh, Fushang Cha, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's a connection that I have with her because I also did my PhD under Professor Cha, uh, but I think about 10 years or so earlier than, than Mary did. Uh, after she finished her PhD, believe it or not, she came and worked in my lab as a postdoc. And um, she spent a couple of years uh, during the golden age of, of my postdoc period when we had four postdocs, all of whom are very prominent professors in various places around the world now. And uh, it, was, it was a great time uh, while she was there. I think I remember sailing with Mary in the Bahamas and I think we did one or two trips to Hawaii with the Pisces subs. And uh, immediately after she left my lab, she went to do another postdoc with Donald Monahan um, at the University of Southern California, who's a well-known uh, larval physiologist and uh, worked there, learned how to learn how to analyze lipids and and do various other biochemical assays. And, and then Donald and I had a grant together. So Mary turned up on Atlantis and we worked at hydrothermal vents at uh, nine degrees north in the Pacific for a period of time. And it was, so it was like Mary was uh, associated with our lab for about four or five years all total. I'm not sure of ent her entire trajectory after that, but she did eventually land in, in Auckland, New Zealand. She's done all kinds of interesting things during the course of her career, not just working on holothurians. She's become very much involved in various kinds of uh, conservation and environmental issues, She's written uh, important papers about ocean acidification, effects of ocean acidification on sea urchin skeletal development is one that comes to mind. Now she's worked um, on something that I found really interesting. She's worked on the microbeads that cosmetic um, manufacturers put inside their products to sort of sand down your face, I guess. And uh, Mary called attention to the fact that those microbeads, uh, when you wash your face, wash out in through the sewer system and eventually make their way out into the marine environment and end up being microplastics. And so I don't know what the final outcome of that is, but she got a lot of attention a few years ago for for pointing that out and uh, doing some work on it. In recent years, Mary's worked uh, in the Antarctic quite a bit, uh, working on, on uh, echinoderms in the Antarctic and reproductive uh, problems in the Ross Sea. Um, and uh, she won't be talking about that today. When I asked her to speak, she said that she had a really interesting recent problem that she had just been working on, and it has to do with the demersal developing Larva. I'm really fascinated to hear about this. So we'll turn the time over to Mary and let her introduce herself. Mary, I've made you the co-host so that you can share your screen with us. All right, I will do that. I recommend that everybody turn their video off and uh, set your uh, uh, set your computer to speaker view rather than gallery view.
Okay, can you see it? Uh, no, we could see it until just now. Now it's gone to a screen that just says Zoom on it. Oh, okay, all right, I'll have to put it over here then. Okay, well, I'll have to look sort of over here because my camera's here and this is here, so that's okay. I that's fine, that. except you, all, you also, okay, that's perfect. Okay. I've got this presentation view. I can't remember how to change that, so you'll just get some advance warning of what I'm going to be speaking about next. So thank you, um, uh, Craig, for the, the introduction. Um, uh, just to follow up on the microplastic story, it's my most cited paper, which is a bit, which is good but not good. I would like to be known for my my invertebrate work rather than a little summer project that showed that plastics were in something that we already knew were there. But that's that's how it is. But it is a piece of work that I am rather proud of because it actually ended up being taken up by a lot of NGOs and has led to the bans of um, these um, items in many countries in the world. So yeah, science can make a difference. So what I want to talk to you about today is a, um, a little project that I've been working on for the last few years, last four or five years, um, on this um, starfish Stegnaster inflatus, which is a asterinid or um, uh, cushion star that's found in New Zealand. And this work has been done with um, uh, a, a number of other people, including um, uh, Natalie Delorme, who was one of my uh, former PhD students, her husband Leo, who was, as often we find ourselves um, uh, at a bit of a loose end between postdocs, so he, he helped with this um, project, uh, Maria Byrne, who you all, of course, all know because of her work in um, echinoderm reproduction, um, who's provided a lot of comparative information, and um, two uh, undergraduate students, um, uh, Lottie Borra and uh, Fiona Lawler, who have contributed quite a lot to this project, and, and it wouldn't have gone so quickly without um, them. So Stegnaster is... Um, is uh, an unusual starfish and it's known worldwide for this unusual feeding posture that it um, has um, in um, that it gets up on the tippy toes of or tippy ends of its arms and creates this little cave um, and when um, some unsuspecting shrimp or fish or, or um, a, a gastropod goes into the cave it slams down on on top of it and um, then uh, consumes it. So it's, um, it's quite well known for that aspect, but we know very little about its um, reproduction. And so what we did know before we started this experiment is that it had large eggs. Um, Maria had dissected them out um, at one point, um, uh, or actually Mike Barker had dissected them out for Maria, this was in one of her papers, and said it was a thousand microns. Uh, when uh, Tom Prowse, um, uh, who was one of Maria's PhD students, came to work with me on lipids of um, echinoderm eggs. Uh, we spawned some and found that was considerably smaller, only about 400 um, microns. We knew based on its egg size and its lipid content that it was probably a lestotroph. Um, and it had an aboral or abactinal um, gonopore. So that means that the, the gonopore was on the top. And this becomes a little um, bit important later when we talk about what kind of reproduction it might have. So the research we had done with Tom, um, this is it here, Stegnester inflatus, this is a whole lot of other asterinid um, uh, uh, eggs uh, here, um, has a large amounts of, of lipids. Um, if, if you compare here, this is um, uh, about um, 1,000 to 2,000 mic. Um, yeah, nanograms, so about a microgram of lipid, which is really big. Now, where does it fit in the um, phylogeny? You can't read all these names, it's not really that important. Stegnaster is up here in this red box up here. It's grouped with um, two um, other uh, groups. Uh, these are uh, Paranopanthia. We know based on egg size that they are lesotrophs, but that's all we know. Um, then there's a large group of um, uh, species including Meridiastra and Cryptasterina um, that Maria Byrne has been working on for many years. Um, they all have pelagic lestotropes. 
And then we have a small group uh, clay down the bottom here. Um, there's a parvulastra uh, exigua, uh, which has a benthic um, uh, lestotrophic larvae. And um, uh, there's uh, two uh, genera that are brooders, both brooding inside the ovary. So within the, the asterinids in this group, we have a wide diversity of lestotrophic um, strategies from pelagic less, um, lestotrophy to benthic lestotrophy and um, to uh, brooding as well. So when we um, started working on this uh, species, um, we, we were not having any predictions of what kind of um, reproduction it might have. So we uh, dissected the gonads from the, the adults and um, we induced spawning with one methylatinine. You just soak them in uh, the eggs or the gonads in this um, solution for about an hour and um, they will un go, undergo the last juvenile vesicle breakdown to be able to be fertilized. Now we started culturing these in four um, liter containers and here we had our first problem because in echinoderms usually we um, have use a stirrer or some kind of bubbler to keep the, the um, larvae in suspension. And we couldn't keep them in suspension. They would sink to the bottom. Uh, and in, um, when culturing larvae, you don't want these things to be sitting on the bottom because that's where all the bacteria is. And, and um, we, we cultures often crash when you have lots of material on the bottom. So we were like really perplexed. We tried um, uh, the common thought is that bubbling is really bad for echinoderm larvae, though we've been bubbling for years and hasn't given any problems, but we had to really, really turn the bubblers up really high to be able to get these off the bottom. And um, this, was, this was really perplexing to us. We knew that the eggs were negatively buoyant, which is very common for echinoderms, um, uh, and we were able to fertilize them, though it actually wasn't very obvious that they were fertilized because the egg is, is quite yolk filled. And if you look at the embryo here, it doesn't look that much different from the, the previous stage. Um, at 26 hours, they became um, a moving embryo. Then um, these uh, hatched. This is not a particularly good picture, but you can still see the fertilization membrane around the outside there. And then within uh, the two days, we had these uh, early brachialaria larvae, and we'll look a bit more detail of the anatomy of that um, shortly. Um, these um, uh, then um, uh, settled uh, on, on, the, on the bottom. They actually did start attaching to the bottom. They metamorphosed. This is the remnant of the larval body that still remains. And then they became a juvenile within about um, uh, two days. Now we did some um, scanning EMs of the, of the larvae here, and they're, they're pretty simplistic um, uh, asteroid brachialaria. Um, they have three brachia around the top here, and this, this is the adhesive uh, disc, but it actually was actually quite um, uh, reduced. And, and this is where Maria's expertise came into, into play because she was like, oh gosh, this is quite interesting. It doesn't seem to be, um, um, have a lot of cilia that associated with it. This is a close up here of the cilia. Um, so it was sparse. Um, when we, uh, but we didn't actually have enough photographs to measure how sparse it was. And when the paper went to review, they made us take that out because we didn't have any quantitative information on how many cilia per millimeter. So it's, it's quite, quite weakly um, uh, ciliated. Now, if we compare it to other um, pelagic um, lestotrophs, um, it's got the same basic form uh, with these three brachial arms in an adhesive disc though it, it does actually have um, a little uh, less cilia um, than um, might be um, expected um, for a plagic lesotrope. When we, um, Charlotte Borra, uh, who was the undergraduate who was working with us, did um, just some really simple assays on um, how quickly they, they sank. And as they got um, uh, into more advanced stages, there were changes in how quickly uh, they sank, so we just did this in a, in a measuring uh, cylinder, but the, the hatched um, early brachialaria sank the fastest, and as we'll see why later on, that is because um, there is some loss of lipid, which is loss of buoyancy, so they are sinking a whole lot um, faster than, than they were when they were an egg. 
we um, uh, looked at the behavior of these larvae. They would actively swim at the very bottom of the tank. So if we took any, any of the bubblers away, they would always be around the bottom. And we wondered um, whether if this was a gravity thing or whether they were seeking um, you know, some kind of shade. Because remember, the, the uh, normal posture of the animal is to live um, producing this cave. And it quite often is found under ledges like this or as shown upside down uh, in this photo from the paper from Grace. So when we go collecting them, we, um, as Fiona will recall, you have to kind of like put your hand underneath the ledges and feel around and find if there's any um, starfish that are in there. So therefore we wrapped, uh, we put them in a glass beaker and wrapped it with foil. And if we did that, then they tended to go up into the water column, um, suggesting that they um, didn't mind being in the dark. But if we uh, did it um, with light and a control um, beaker, most of them went to the, body, the bottom. So it seemed like there was something going on with um, the addition of light. So we, then we went to look at what their closest relative. There is another species of the genus Stegnaster, which is found in um, the Eastern Atlantic around the Bahamas. Um, I think a little bit deeper than, the, than this um, species from memory. It has a um, oral, a gonopore um, or actinal gonopore and uh, this is, um, a, is an egg laying species with a benthic larvae that is likely to be attached to the substratum during development though I found this in a paper though I've, nobody seems to have described um, the actual shape of the, of the larvae that it has. The other group that Paranapanthia uh, group that's on, on the same clade as it um, Paranapanthia aucklandensis was, uh, has a, a large yolky eggs and abactinal um, genital openings, so on the top. So um, Mortensen, a very famous uh, early echinoderm worker, had said it um, was a planktonic lesotroph, that it, it wasn't a brooder. Um, and the Paranapanthia grandis, um, uh, from Maria's work, we know that it has um, a large egg, 800 microns, which is about twice the size of what we have in Stegnesta at Inflatus, um, but we don't know its um, larval form. There is one other group that's closely related, which is um, a genus of um, Tremaster. And this species, um, the Tremaster uh, eggs, were first reported by Clark to um, undergo development around the mouth. So it basically the the, the starfish sat on top of the, the substrate um, and then uh, was um, later work suggested that they might brood inside the um, brood um, some brood chambers so we're not totally sure on um, what Tremaster is doing. The next question is really is the position of the gonopore important? Um, Mordenson had thought that the um, abactinal, so on the top, suggested that they were being released into the water column and that they would have um, pelagic lestertrophy. Now Stegnaster has um, uh, its gonopores abactinal, so on the top, and so that would suggest if, if gonopore position is important that they might also have um, a pelagic lestertrophy. But in the um, asterionids that have benthic lestertrophy, they um, form a, tr well, a tripod larvae, uh, which um, is uh, shown here, which is very exaggerated with these arms that help attach them to the bottom, which um, Stegnest is actually um, missing. Um, the next question is, is Stegnest a brooder? Um, we, uh, Mordenson actually had suggested that the dome-like behavior that was, had been reported by Peria in 1875, so this has been known for a long time, he suggested that it might have some connection with brooding, but um, nothing is about this is known. For future observations on living specimens, I love these old papers where they talk about for the future observations and a hundred years later, we still actually, nearly a hundred years later, we still actually don't have those um, observations. So we know it's negatively buoyant, it's weakly ciliated, it's quite a poor swimmer, um, and, and we thought it could be a, um, a either a demersal larvae or a, the adult might sit um, on top of it um, or near it. Um, this is an image from Tozier because I don't have a, um, a picture of uh, Trimaster, 
but it could be something that's really the larvae are associated with the bottom and not spending a lot of time in the, the water column. And this was the, um, published in the first paper in Invertebrate Biology in 2019, uh, which has most of the images and information that I presented up to um, this point for those of you who are interested in more. So that, this was a talk that I presented, um, or part of this talk was um, presented at the North American um, uh, Echinoderm Conference, which was in um, Worcester, Massachusetts, which was a special symposium for John Pierce, who has um, been a huge loss to the Echinoderm community. And uh, he had done a, um, some work in the Antarctic in, as part of his PhD work and had suggested that um, starfish uh, that's commonly found near Odentasta validus might be a demersal um, species. That was because um, it, um, uh, the larvae in culture were closely asso associated with the bottom of his culture dishes. He later found out that this was not true, that it was actually found in the water um, column. Uh, but we don't actually have many records of, um, of demersal larvae. So if to weigh up whether this was a demersal larvae or not, um, the factors that might suggest it could be, well, that is uh, the weak ciliation and a poor swimmers um, and the abactinal gonopore, which suggests it might be pelagic um, uh, if it's re um, released into the water column. Or it could be a brooder, but there's no actual brooding structure, so it would just have to sit on top of the of the eggs as they develop. Remember development is only for 12 days, so it's not a huge amount of time um, uh, for the female not to be able to, to eat um, uh, while she was brooding. We never saw brooding in the lab. We did try to induce this. We went through this series of experiments, failed experiments, where we um, uh, injected um, one MA in the lab thinking we might be able to induce some kind of um, uh, natural uh, spawning uh, um, and we never got spawning or any kind of um, behavior that was um, around. And um, even though Mordenson suggests we need to go and look at living specimens, it's going to be really, really hard to do this. It's found in the very sh shallow subtitle, um, uh, generally um, around 10 meters or up into the very edge of the intertidal zone, which is actually quite hard area to work in because it's kind of when there's waves, it's a bit rough. And it's, and because of their habits of living under ledges, it's not something that you can observe with um, with uh, any kind of scuba gear. So then our next um, uh, questions were uh, to, can we learn a bit more about reproduction in Stegnaster um, from looking at, at the eggs. And because this is a graduate seminar, I've um, just take us back. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, so excuse this for those of you who are experts in this um, field. But egg size is actually a pretty good indicator of um, what kind of development things have. And uh, we know that small eggs, or in echinoderms anyway, this, this is not necessarily true of every phyla, generally have uh, planktotrophic development with a feeding larvae and a greater time to um, metamorphosis. And that large eggs uh, have a lesser trophic development uh, with a non-feeding larvae and a shorter time to metamorphosis. And this is, this is work that was done by you know, Gunnar Thorson in um, 1950. Every time I review a, a paper who doesn't cite Gunnar Thorson, I, I um, uh, tell them that they should because he did an amazing work um, uh, in marine biology and um, I, I think one of his least uh, well-known works was a work he did on um, the meriplankton in the fjords, the Danish fjords, uh, and during the Second World War he would go out in a rowing boat while the U-boats and everything else were going up and down the fjords to collect his plankton samples, so quite an interesting man. Now, this is a, a slide for, for Craig. This is a flashback to when I was a postdoc um, at Harbour Branch with him. This is some work that I did there, um, uh, pulling together uh, asteroid egg sizes. And uh, you can see there's color coded. So our planktotrophs are in, um, in blue, our lesotrophs in uh, yellow, and the brooding species in, um, in green. And then everything else we don't know for sure what, they, um, what kind of strategy they have is, is in white. Now, Stegnester has an egg of egg size of around 392 or around there, 
Uh, so it's um, it right here in this, as shown by the red arrow. So it's slightly on the small side compared to um, a lot of other um, lesser trophic um, asteroids. Now most um, echinoderm uh, eggs um, mainly are protein and lipid. Um, they make up about 70% of the dry weight um, in echinoderms. Lactotrophic eggs are, tend to be more protein rich and lactotrophic eggs seem to be more um, uh, lipid rich. But it's not only what um, the proteins and lipids they have, these are divided into different types. Those are that are form energy and are used um, for the larvae to develop and those that um, are used for structural uh, reasons to make lipid membranes and all of the organs that are part of, of the, the animal. So we know um, from lots of other work that the energy lipids um, in echinoderms are, um, are major yolk protein, um, echinoferrin and or vitalogenin, whichever um, words you like to use. And the lipids tend to be triglycerides and wax esters, those kind of um, energy rich uh, lipids. And the structural lipids and proteins, there's, there's not much um, knowledge of what they, they are, but in uh, lipids, uh, these are phospholipids and cholesterol. And, and as Craig alluded to, when I was a postdoc with Donald Manahan, I um, uh, developed with a lot of uh, people in the lab techniques to um, use um, this machine. It's called IatraScan. Uh, this is the machine here. Uh, and basically it's a thin layer chromatography, that's the TLC, uh, combined with flame ionization detection, which is the FID part. And basically you um, uh, spot your lipid sample on these little chroma rods, which are essentially mini TLC plates. You develop them in um, whatever hexane based um, solvent system you want to, to separate all the lipid classes. Uh, and then you put this in the machine and it's got a hydrogen flame that burns off the lipids. And this is collected, these burned off lipids are collected in a detector and they produce these nice little chr chromatograms. And you can easily, um, differentiated between your energy and structural lipids. So I've color coded these here. So in this, this is um, our effective hydrocarbon, which I just noticed here is HC and I forgot to change that. Um, uh, our triacylglyceride um, and our free fatty acids, which weren't found in this, these are eggs of um, Evokinus, which I did this developmental work on. Uh, and uh, the structural lipids are shown here in blue. So we can get quite a lot of information about the ratio of uh, energy to structural lipids. And work that I did with Tom Prowse, who is Maria Burns, um, a PhD student, again on asterionids, um, we found these were the planktotrophic species and these are lesotrophic species, and this is the benthic lesotroph here. And one of the other things we found that the lipid to protein ratio also changes because um, uh, in lysotrophic um, development, you're not developing uh, feeding uh, structures. Um, so you use um, uh, less um, uh, protein. Now the plantotrophs have got um, less lipid, more um, uh, to protein, lots more lipids um, in the um, pelagic lysotrophs, which also helps them with flotation. And the benthic lysotroph has got um, a much lower uh, lipid to protein ratio, which suggests that, uh, or Tom suggested was like a weight belt because proteins are heavier, would make it more um, sinky. We also knew, as I've already alluded to, that the fact that um, uh, Stegnasta had um, a reasonable amount of lipid um, and that these, um, as in the other asteroids, were um, a, a special type of lipid called DAGE, diacylglycerol ether, not, that's not entirely important, but just have, comparing it to the other uh, less the trophic species, it does actually have um, a slightly less lipid, but remember, recall it also has a slightly smaller egg. Now the, we did, um, this is uh, Leo and Natalie, um, and I did um, spawned a whole lot of um, uh, different individuals, and we confirmed um, that um, Tom's information that we did have um, our, this major energetic lipid was this um, DAGE um, our, and otherwise the eggs were very similar between um, females. So we looked at the um, use of the lipid during development 
Um, so here are the stages across the top. So here's our embryo, our early blastula, late brachialaria, uh, uh, settled and our juvenile. And um, surprisingly to us, we found that about 51% of this um, uh, lipid um, DAGE remained at the end of, um, of the developmental life. So after, from, from um, egg to um, the juvenile stage, which seemed to us to be rather a lot. Um, the um, protein um, uh, investment was used more it was only about 13% of the protein that was remaining, but remember it didn't actually have that much uh, protein to start with. And this was our second paper, which was published in MEPS um, uh, earlier this year. Um, uh, and as part of that um, our paper, we did a review of um, the um, maternal provisioning in other lysotropic echinoderms. Now there's actually weren't that many studies and most of them were ours, but um, it was good to actually pull this together. Um, uh, and so here's our data here, 55% um, of the lipids le left in Stegnaster. Um, this is a, um, a study done by um, uh, Brian uh, in 2004. Again, 50% um, of the lipids were remaining at the end. Uh, and uh, HEP comparatum, Here's some work that was done um, on Helosideros that shows we have about 67% um, of the lipids um, re remaining at the end. So this was intriguing for us because these are lysotropes who are really over provisioning the eggs because there's so much um, uh, lipid uh, is going into the egg that's not being used in larval development. So it presumably is being used um, for the, the juvenile stage. Because from a life history perspective, if you put less lipid into each egg, you could make more of them, which might be an advantage. Um, we now take a blast with plast and go back to some work that Richard Emlett um, did uh, when he was working in Australia on uh, Heliosidaris, um, where uh, he reduced the amount of lipid in the egg by um, uh, centrifuging. And so uh, in the blastula stage, all the lipids are in the center of the, um, of the embryo here. And uh, uh, these guys discovered that if you centrifuge them, you could remove the lipids from um, the egg. And um, when you um, had these reduced uh, lipid um, uh, individuals, they were much smaller at settlement than um, the uh, one control larvae. So we thought, well, let's give this a crack. If these um, uh, um, lipids are being used by the juvenile, let's try to reduce um, the amount of lipids that we have in our steglaster effect. And we uh, initially thought, well, maybe this is going to extend their development time, we might have a different settlement time, they might be a smaller size at settlement as um, uh, they had seen in the, the previous work on Heliostaris, or they might grow at a different weight. So we thought, okay, we're going to fertilize the eggs, we're going to develop them into blastula, we're going to centrifuge them, and we, then we're going to get them to grow. This is problem number two, because in Stegnaster, the blastula is not yet hatched, so we couldn't centrifuge them um, at that stage because they still had the fertilization membrane holding the lipids in place. Uh, and Fiona did experiments and basically all she did was give the um, uh, uh, blastula a bit of a headache and no lipids came out. So then we had to find a method to remove the fertilization membrane from the blastula. Uh, and when uh, Fiona found a um, very old paper from 1976 from workers in Japan, that showed that if you gave them washes in uh, one molar um, urea, you could um, remove um, the uh, fertilization membrane. And I've just dotted on this image here where the membrane has been removed. And then once the, the, um, these embryos then go into the centrifuge, then that uh, fertilization membrane comes off. Then of course we had to work out how much centrifuging to give them. Um, uh, the Emlet and Hugh Goldberg study, they had given them 15,000 RPM for 15 seconds and they had done this three times and then washed off the um, 
uh, lipids um, at each uh, time. Uh, again, uh, as in most um, new scientific endeavors, there's a lot of failures um, that go on. Uh, 15,000 was too much because we are not only have to get them to be centrifuge, we have to get them to be able to grow and survive. So that was too much for Stegnasta and eventually we um, uh, figured out that um, 10,000 was quite good and then we tried one at um, 8,000 which was we thought would remove a little less lipid and so then we might be able to have a regression kind of approach. So our um, experimental setup, we had our controls, we did nothing to them. We had our second set of controls, which because we had to give them the urea treatment, which might actually influence their um, uh, growth rate, we um, uh, had a control for that. Then we had uh, our treatment with, uh, at 8,000 RPM um, uh, centrifuging and uh, our second treatment at um, 10,000 RPM. So we're trying to remove the lipids from, from the blastocele and then get them to grow. Well, how to prove that we had removed the lipids? I'm not sure how well this is going to show on what um, on your what you're seeing, but I've uh, highlighted here what we called the lipid streak that was um, coming off from the um, the centrifuged um, uh, cells on the bottom. Maybe it might be a bit more uh, visible here. So it appeared that something was getting into the water that wasn't there before we had done the centrifuging. Uh, uh, Fiona also um, uh, measured this in terms of our blastula size. Um, again, you can see, so these are listed as our two controls and then our two treatments here. And you can see that they are uh, um, generally significant, though the, the trend is a little bit different on these three different females that we have done with this. But we are actually reducing um, the, um, the size of the blastula, which suggests to me that maybe some, some of the contents are coming out. We uh, did take some TEM samples, which are still um, are not processed yet, and we have got some lipid samples, um, uh, which are still next, next to do, because as you will all understand, 2020 has been a very interesting year in terms of um, our research. In the, um, in the uh, paper, that I had published about the um, sinkability rates of the larvae, I had suggested um, that somebody should do some density it, it, um, uh, work to actually work out if they really were um, sinking or not. So um, after, again, the, the great work of um, Fiona, we uh, developed a, a sucrose density gradient system, which we've coloured here with food colouring because, of course, sucrose is, is transparent. And you, it was very, very difficult to um, determine where the um, layers um, were. So we used food colouring to um, change, um, uh, visualise the density. And those of you with good eyes might be able to see there's little spots of, of, of uh, larvae that are in here. So we were able to create the density gradient, put the um, uh, larvae in, and then work out which, um, which layer that, that they formed in. Um, so here I'm presenting this as specific gravity, so that is the density of the sucrose um, in relative to seawater, so one would mean it's the, exactly the same density as, as seawater, and if it's less than one, they're floating, things float, and if they are greater than one, they sink, uh, and as you can see, um, in all of our treatments, we got sinking, um, and when we took the lipids out, um, there um, uh, was a change in the um, uh, density of, of the, the eggs. So the, the white bar is um, uh, the control, the yellow bar is the um, second control without urea, which really doesn't change, and the, uh, the first treatment isn't really um, changing that much, but there is quite a shift in mode in the second treatment, the 10,000, RPM, so they do become much more sinking. So this all tends to suggest that we've got, um, uh, uh, have actually successfully removed some of the lipids. And then of course this happened. So in um, uh, the 28th of February, we had our first COVID case in New Zealand. And on the 14th of March, the government introduced a mandatory self-isolation for anyone coming into the country from overseas. 
The 19th of March, these all gatherings over 100 people were banned. On the 21st of March, so this is all happening all, all within a couple of weeks, the, um, we announced our COVID alert levels. So we had four alert levels, level one, which was what we're actually at now, um, up to four, which is the um, when we're trying to um, remove uh, um, coronavirus from, from being in the community. So they introduced this on Friday, the system on the Friday. On the Monday, we moved to level three. So this, the university had already decided we not going. To, we have to shift to teaching online. So we're going to have a teaching free week. So they basically gave the students a week off, which was a, allow time for the staff to prepare for the impending um, uh, online teaching. The Monday of that week, the, the Prime Minister said we're now at level three, which basically means that we, we couldn't be at university, we couldn't be at, uh, in our offices, and there was like a mad panic um, of people going to the supermarket buying food. Um, on the Wednesday, we went into level four, which was basically the whole country is locked down. Nothing is happening. Um, and um, we were in that stage until the 27th of April, so for about a month. Now, in this period between our, the 23rd of March and the 25th of March, the university said, we're closing down, you have to finish all of your experiments. So after doing, oh, no, sorry, I forgot this. So he, our Prime Minister has been um, a pretty amazing leader in the COVID space, uh, and we have successfully done what um, the epidemiologists want us to do, and that we want to flatten the curve, as shown as this little um, graphic over here. This is our COVID cases. This is from Monday when I when I did it. Um, you can see we we actually did exactly what the epidemiologists um, suggested in terms of flattening our curve. The only uh, COVID cases in New Zealand are um, are now from people returning from overseas, and everyone is in government quarantine uh, in managed isolation for 14 days, and they have to be tested twice before they're left out into the community, which is why we are now having a normal life. But unfortunately, our stagnastic experiments were a consequence of this. So we, uh, well, we, Fiona, um, magnificent Fiona, did this with uh, uh, three females. So female two, uh, female five and female six, female three and four, we, cultures crashed, these things happen. But unfortunately, we had to end because on the 24th, it was like the seawater system is closing down. You have to end your experiments. So we had already um, had the uh, female two in culture for about 35 days, about 28 in the um, uh, F5 and slightly shorter in uh, F6. And so that was the end of our grand experiment. Um, uh, and so we were able to take um, photographs of these um, before we were able, before the experiment was completely uh, closed down. And they did suggest that, that the juveniles in the treated uh, experiments were a bit smaller um, than um, the uh, uh, non-reduced uh, lipid categories. Uh, we had very few um, uh, uh, survived this um, just the urea treatment. But there is a hint that the juveniles are a bit smaller, which um, is uh, sort of what um, the uh, Emnet and Hilgoberg study had shown in the, in the sea urchin. So this was a little bit disappointing. And our next steps are that we know how to redo the experiment, but the question is when to start, because there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into doing this experiment and COVID is still everywhere. And um, um, I don't have a, a Fiona at the moment to do all of this work um, uh, with me. And so I'm reluctant to start an experiment that isn't going to need to run for three or four months um, uh, with COVID still on the horizon and lockdown um, potentially likely in the, the future. So to conclude from today, um, it, we we know that they have pelagic lesser trophy, but I put that in quotes, but it, because it might be demersal. The abactinal um, gonopores suggest they might be released to the environment, um, but if they are, it's for a very short time, and it may be that they are associated with the with the the, the mother. We know that about half of the maternal lipids are used for development, uh, and that they. Um, 
uh, are going to have quite a lot of lipid reserve available for juvenile growth. We have confirmed with our specific gravity measurements that they really are sinkers. This isn't just, um, uh, they are going to always be pretty much um, close to the, the bottom. And we have um, developed the methods to, for manipulating the amounts of lipid in per embryo, but we need a long period of COVID free time in order to be able to conduct um, these uh, experiments. And I'll just show you, this is a beautiful little juvenile um, uh, stegnaster here. And I'll just finish up with just mentioning what a great species this is to work with, because this is an up, this is the um, aboral and the oral side of this. And um, you may not be able to see, but this is a female. You can actually see through, because the, um, the eggs are bright orange, you can see what, um, uh, what sex it is. And you can actually just dissect out just one gonad and then put the um, female back in the tank um, and come back um, a few days later and to dissect another gonad from her to do her experiments. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any um, questions. I've been talking away with, with my mute on and without my video on. Sorry, let's, let's give her a round of applause first and then we'll uh, give Richard a chance to ask, ask a question. I think he had his hand up. Hi, Mary, uh, that was really neat. Um, did you have any, did you, could you see any visual uh, effect of the spinning them down the way that, that that photograph that we published showed? I mean, are they just too opaque? Um, yeah, we, we couldn't really um, uh, see that because they're just so orange. Yeah. Uh, I think I think in Hilo Solaris, they're quite yellow. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, obviously, you saw our, our black and white picture, but they're not, I mean, a lot of the echinoderms are opaque, just like you're saying. Um, uh, one more question, just briefly. Your picture, your drawing of, of the late uh, Brachiolari stage uh, with it, uh, oriented, it looked like it was oriented upside down. Is that, when they swim on the bottom, I figured they're sideways, but but how are they oriented when they move up and down? Um, they they tend to, to, to sort of roll, um, uh, but yes, they, they tend, those brachias do tend to be a bit heavier at that end from my recollection. But That's yeah. very different than pelagic lustature. Yeah. So that's another, you know, just the orientation part. Um, yeah, yeah. So when they, if they swim up or swim down, they may be reversing ciliary beat to do that and sustaining it. Oh, that's a good point. We'll have to, we'll have to yeah, um, yeah. watch out so, for that. So look at that carefully because that's part of your story, okay? Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Mary, I have a question for you. Yep. I, I'm interested in knowing, um, exactly what the proper definition of demersal development is. And the, the reason I ask that is because you can, you can have larvae that are demersal that are actually sitting on the bottom, associated with the bottom, staying in one place. But we have evidence uh, at methane seeps now that, that there are um, what appear to be planktotrophic larvae of deep sea mussels that instead of migrating up into the water column, uh, they simply drift very, very close to the bottom. Uh, would you consider those to be demersal or not based on where they live in the water column or do they have to have special adaptations for actually hanging on to the bottom or sitting on the bottom in order to be, be defined as such? Well, that's quite a good question. And I think because, because we have such diver diversity of larval type across different phyla, it might be a diff we might need a different... Um, categorization. Um, I mean, I think the issue for me is that is that the original papers that John Pierce did on those demersal larvae, they definitely weren't demersal. But then, then you think about things like sponge larvae that really 
or other short, really short-lived larvae, um, that, that becomes a bit more of a grey area because if you are associated with the bottom because you're actually a short-lived larvae and you're looking for a settlement site, or are you demersal in terms of a strategy, like every, every larvae of that species is going to be in that place. I, I'm, I'm not sure that there is a good definition. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? No, no. This is something that I've thought about quite a bit, but um, it's the only term that's out there at the moment for, for anything that's really associated with the bottom. And, and so uh, I, I think we're using it in several different ways. Yeah, there you go. We'll have to write a paper, Craig. What is a demersal larvae? <laughs> okay, we'll do that. Um, are there other questions? There must be some other questions with all this, all these people interested in larval development. Richard. Uh, Mary, um, it seems like the literature on the role of predation on larvae is all over the place, but at least Richard Strathman has put forward, and, and many of the students in the larval biology class have independent, well, with his, with his pushing, but then followed up, that benthic development is, a, is not a, a good place, that it's maybe safer in the plankton. So I wondered if, I mean, clearly Stegnaster may be defended chemically, but I just wondered if, if any, if you have that view, that being in, on the bottom is dangerous. Yes, well, I would, except that maybe Stegnaster is doing what a lot of other you know, like Leptosterius and Tosia and things, like actually being on top of it. Like if the mother is sitting on top of it or is pretty near to it, then that might not be as dangerous as being um, uh, around um, uh, close to the bottom. So you could equally argue that actually being pelagic and being in the area with all the filter feeding marine invertebrates that are found on a, a rocky reef is also not a particularly safe place. But, but the studies but the studies that have been done experimentally have demonstrated that tethered yeah. animals are more likely to be consumed down below than up above. And that's the basis of my question, the experimental evidence and, and whether that bugs you or not. Or I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, what I'm trying to get at, you know, it's just like, isn't, do you think, I mean, especially in that environment, you described it as 10 meters to low intertidal under rock ledges. It sounds to me like they're in a pretty turbulent place. Yeah, so yeah, they would be. Keep uh, and, and in maybe, your body. maybe bringing them into the lab situation where we don't have that degree of turbulence is, is making, making us think about this incorrectly because maybe in, a, in nature, they... Um, the amount of wave action in those in those particular locations means that they aren't really sinking because they're continually sure. stirred up. I hadn't thought about that before. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, I think your story is consistent with demersalness. I, I don't, you know, and and I just wondered what does that mean for the larva? Are they going to get nailed a lot? Or anyway, I, enough of that. I, I think the point's a, an open question. Nancy Treneman has a question. Thank you very much for that uh, seminar. The starfish are so neat. I love the way they stand on their legs, looking like some kind of tent. Um, picking up what Richard said, you mentioned how hard it was. You had to really ramp the bubblers up to get those larvae to circulate. Yeah. So maybe that's what's that's why is that the turbulence they experience in nature is uh allows them to have more lipids and proteins because they're in this uh very turbulent environment and i'm also wondering if they're in the surf or in this uh, low intertidal they're gonna will they, are they carried out you know or is is that gonna move them out of the environment that you find the adults in uh, yes, this is an area that I haven't really been thinking about at, um, up to this point. You raise a good point because yes, maybe, maybe that is um, what we need to think Sorry. about, not what happens in the lab, but what happens uh, in, the, in the environment. It could be that that is the, the case. Yeah. Okay. Sebastian. 
so I might not be getting this correctly, but but you're talking about how all these larvae are kind of sinkers. They, they like to sink. They have they have their, their lipids kind of do that. But then you also found that when you wrap the foil around the um, beaker, that they actually rose up. So how how are those two related? Why would they be behaving differently in the darkness than they would? Yes, this is this is something that I can't haven't been able to get my head around, and I think that that's um, those. Um, experiments that we did in the dark and the light were really just sort of simple ones that that we didn't repeat and I think we need to do that again now that we know more about 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 the how sinky they really are um, but it, they are ciliated even if they are weakly ciliated and we did allow them many hours in the dark to, to go that so um, we need to actually get get down and do the, some of those behavioral experiments a bit more systematically and a bit more um, um, consistently. I, I think that the first, we did those experiments in the first summer that we did the experiments and we really didn't know as much as what we know now. So I think we would go back with that and do it differently. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hey, what is the geographic distribution? How, how wide is the geographic distribution for Stagnaster? And has anyone done any genetic work to do like DNA barcoding to see how connected the populations are? And that might indicate how far they can dis disperse. Um, uh, I think it's found mainly throughout, most of our species are found in the whole of New Zealand. I think it's, it's mainly across the whole, um, um, uh, area and yes, you'd be right. That would be now that we know um, about their development, um, it would be uh, the next obvious thing to look at would be to do some some work on the genetics. And and I have have thought about that. I'm just waiting for the right um, student to come along to to do that because uh, it's actually pretty abundant. And one of the other things that um, you might have noticed in one of the slides, it's very um, diverse in colour. It has like it's found in yellows and oranges and browns and, and purples and, and, and greys and things like that. So that's also something that's been a little bit intriguing because I'm always getting um, uh, emails from members of the public. What is this starfish? I've never seen this purple starfish before. And I'm like, oh, it's just the same one as the brown one <laughs> and the yellow one and whatever. So yeah, it's, that's, that's something that's also intriguing why, why you have such a diversity of, of, of color morph. So that's, that's also not that uncommon in asteroids, like Pateria is also very variable in color as well. So yeah, the genetics would be really interesting to, to look at. And 12 days is, is a pretty, pretty short developmental time for, for yeah. starfish as well. Okay, I don't see any more uh, questions. So with that, Mary, uh, we thank you again very, very much. One last round of applause, everybody. Uh, that was a great seminar. I've already been having requests for a, for a recording of it so that, so that people can look at it again. So that's a good sign. Uh, we liked your seminar. Oh, thank you very um, much. So thanks very much. Um, at this point, we will... Um, We'll excuse everybody but Michael and Lindsay and Mary. We're going to have an editorial meeting for the Atlas of Marine Invertebrate Larvae. <laughs> so thanks, everybody.